vision I have now, I'm not behind on. It's just that's that next phase. And what we built in the last five to 10 years still support it. But the goals have to serve your purpose. Your goals have to serve your vision. If they don't serve your vision, they don't serve your purpose. There's no sense in pursuing them, you know, because if, if your goals do serve you and, and the vision, it's easy to make those adjustments when you're like, hey, I was 80% right on that. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Big Dog Podcast. I guess I'm still the big dog. It's Josh. Got the little dog in the background, Logan. What's going on, Logan? You doing all right? He hates it when I do this because he's got to mute, unmute. <laughs> That's why I do it to you. And then he pops in and he disappears. Uh, but no, everything is going great here at the Big Dog Podcast. It's a beautiful day out in Virginia. And guys, I got a really fun guest for us today, uh, Stephen McBee. If you don't know about McBees or the McBees right now, you're under a rock. The McBee Dynasty debuted on the 11th, I believe, on Peacock. And I'm already done with the season. It was a ton of fun to watch. And Stephen and I... I met about a year ago uh, through a group called Apex, mutual friend and Ryan Stuman. And we just got connected, talking about different stuff, business and things. And when this hit off, I was like, oh man, we got to get him on the show and, and have a convo. So Stephen McBee, welcome to the Big Dog Podcast. Yeah, thank you guys for having me on. I really appreciate it. How's everything out in your world? Crazy? <laughs> It's uh, yeah, it's been a whirlwind, especially over the last couple of weeks, been traveling all across the country, um, been trying to keep the businesses afloat while we're out here doing press and just just pushing the show as much as we can. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Talk a little bit, if you will, for, for those who are just learning about the show or or the family. You know, you guys are about, what, an hour north of Kansas City is where the farm is? That's correct. Yeah, we've got a big farming and ranching operation about an hour north of Kansas City. Okay. And what are the primary things you guys have going on out there? Yeah, so on the row crop side, corn, soybeans, conventional row crop. Uh, and then on the protein side, we run uh, beef, bison, pork, uh, and then just starting to venture into some of the exotics. So, uh, you know, USDA inspected deer and elk as well. Nice. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. And you and the brother, you guys grew up on the farm. So funny story, actually. Um, we're first generation farmers. My, uh, I've got three younger brothers. Yep. We all grew up in Independence, Missouri, which is about 30 okay. minutes, 20 minutes outside of Kansas City, just to the east. Yep. Um, and uh, we grew up there. We had the farm since 1998. My dad bought his first small tract of land up there. We just loved being up there at the farm on weekends, so hunting, yeah. fish, things like that. Um, but I did not move up to the farm and really be on the farm full time until after I got out of high school. Um, nice. And that's it. That's a little bit of a secret. A lot of people were like, oh, it's a multi-generation farm. They grew up on the farm. Uh, you know, it was handed down from granddaddy to his dad, yeah. the boys. And that's just not the case. We're first generation farmers trying to figure things out as we go. And um, obviously we've grown really, really quickly. But uh, yeah, we're we're learning as we go. Yeah, that was one thing I thought was super interesting because I didn't know that until the first episode of the show. And it was talking about how your dad had bought that first parcel late nineties. And I was like, Oh shit. Like this is legit figuring it out. Oh and, yeah. And you know, and then the, the exponential growth over that time where you see a lot of these generational ranches and farms over the last 20, 30 years have gotten smaller because of development and things like that. You see the McBee setup expanding by leaps and bounds um and the fact that it was just a a recent piece you know for the family to start into and go down that path what do you know what initially got your dad like wanting to do that it's a funny story i mean we bought that first small tract just for hunting and fishing we loved okay. the outdoors grew up hunting and fishing so that was what we bought it for we leased it out to a local farmer who would farm the tillable acreage on it and we'd go up there on the weekends and there'd be people fishing in the ponds there'd be beer cans all around the ponds and we're like what are you doing? This is our land. And they're like, well, the farmer gave us permission. And so that was what we're like, all right, screw that. Enough of that. Kick the farmer yeah. off. We're just going to do it ourselves. Yeah. And that was in 2005. Okay. So we farmed a hundred acres in 2005, bought an old John Deere and just tried to do it ourselves. And we were horrible. I mean, <laughs> if you don't have experience in farming, 
it is a learning curve that I cannot begin to describe. You would think it's as easy as just putting a seed in the ground. And sure. it's not. There is so much to it and uh, so many nuances. And so we learned uh, very quickly that farming is not an ease of entry business. And so 2005 was our first year going at it. I'd have been 11 or 12 years old, um, but I was still working on the farm. I was going up there running tractors at 11, 12 years old. Didn't know what I was doing and, and yeah. obviously too young to be you know, considered like a full-time worker. Um, but I was still just kind of easing into what farming is and, and how to do it. And uh, my dad had a telecom uh, company, telecommunications down in Kansas City. Uh, that's where he generated a lot of his income, most of his income to buy the farm. Yeah. Uh, and then with the real estate crash in 2008, started investing into residential real estate in Kansas City. We were buying properties for no money down. At that time, banks were like, please take this property. Like sure. no one wanted property. And so he was buying these properties. He didn't have the cash. Like if he was trying to go out uh, in today's market and buy these properties, he wouldn't have had a chance. Sure. But no money down at the time. And so they were basically just handing over these properties. So he was scooping them up because he understood this was a once in a lifetime buying opportunity. And that paid off leaps and bounds within 10 years because 2008, he started buying. In 2018, these properties that he bought for twenty dollars and $30,000 a door, we were flipping for a hundred to 120000 a door. Absolutely. So that was, that was like the big catalyst for how the yeah. fall blew up. Because then once we sold off these properties in Kansas City, we 1031 them into farm ground. And that's how the farm shot up so fast. Now, the farm, how much acreage, I guess, do you guys operate now? Yeah, so personally, between my dad, my brother Jesse and I, we own 18,000 acres of ground. Um, and then we lease the rest. We're farming 40,000 acres. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And then that's not all contiguous, is it? No, no. Our biggest chunk is about 8,500 acres that we own. And okay. for Missouri, that's a pretty good size continuous yeah. piece of land. Um, you know, it's not like the Western ranches where you get 50,000 acres continuous out here and where you guys are at, I'm sure it's hard yeah. to put together 500 acres. Oh yeah. No, if you see, if you see a piece of land come up, that's over, you know, 300, 350 acres here in Virginia, you're like, what? Yeah. Where? And then you see the commas next to it and you understand exactly what's going on. So some, someone's been sitting on that literally since the boats landed, you know, if, if they still have, you know, those pieces, it was like Lords of England, you know, signing over, you know, this land, land grants back in the day um, with those big, big tracks and the pro the homes on those big tracks are also out here. Something really special to see because they were built in like 1600s and they're these huge manors. It's, it's insanity, but no, most the farms, out here i mean you're talking about 100 acre smaller tracks um you know someone does have a larger operation you know they're piecing them together but they're not ran up you know contiguous together so yeah. that's yeah, interesting thousand acre spans i would say 130 miles circumference okay uh, is our farming circumference yeah that's awesome and mm -hmm. so what talk about kind of <laughs> through the show i i told you know, you've, I've already watched the whole freaking season. Um, super entertaining, totally wild. I'm like, what is going on right here? Your brothers are a trip. Your dad's nuts. Um, like the whole, the whole thing. I just, every time I turn around, I'm like, what in the hell is Steve doing? Like what? <laughs> the man's wild. And it's unfortunate because just out of obviously creating a reality show, they're, sure. they're trying to drum up the drama. My dad has skill sets and talent that, I like it's so crazy how talented he is in certain aspects. Yep. You couldn't replace that. So yep. you're looking at him and you're like, man, this he's a train wreck. What is he doing in the companies? Well, the companies didn't grow to be the size they were for no reason. Like he's That's a it. genius when it comes to tense negotiations, when it comes to deal cutting, when it comes to construction, like that yeah. things that no one else can do. And then um, he in dealing with stress, too, he can deal with stress, which business is all about stress. All management. of it. Yep. He can deal with that like no other. And I think the way he offsets that is by his personal life. It is, <laughs> <as fun. laughs> well, no, he has a great time. I was like, man, this is this is fun. This is fun. Now, talk about like all all the brothers are involved in the farm and operation as well. Correct. Yeah. So my brother, uh, Jesse, he's mostly overhead of construction on the car wash side. Okay. Uh, he needs If we need him during planning or harvest, he's sort of a fill-in guy. So we cross-utilize labor across our companies where necessary. Um, yeah. My brother, Cole, full-time on the farm, loves the farm and ranch. Like He actually moved up to Gallatin, Missouri to go to high school there. He's the only one that graduated high school in that little town because he okay. loved it so much. Um, and then my youngest brother, Brayden, works on the car wash side too. Um, okay. So 
we all kind of have our specialty skill sets where we focus in across our portfolio of companies. Uh, but the farm and ranch is our, our passion and heart, uh, and, yeah. and where we want to be. It's just, it's hard to make a farm and ranch profitable. No, I mean, that's what I have. I've heard that so many times and so many of the, the aspects of the business, you really don't have any control over, None. you know, you don't necessarily get to control cost. You, depending on what it is that you're selling, you, you can't control the weather. Yep. You, you know, you spend all this money to put, you know, seed in the ground. If there's no rain, there's no rain, which is going to limit what grows, which limits what you sell. I don't even think a lot of that stuff on the agriculture side, you necessarily get to set price points. No, there's the no, garage. There's none of that. It's commodity based right. pricing. My corn is worth the exact same value as my neighbors. It doesn't matter how we farmed it or whatever we did to it. That's right. And so, no, I mean, that's got to be to the point you made about your dad, like the stress management piece and to be able to see through that, mm -hmm. still be successful through that when you have such little control over it. It's, it's really remarkable. And so you guys do have these other venues, mm -hmm. these other revenue chains. I know that, you know, you've got the, the meat company. Right. And you guys just recently have brought processing on site. Correct. Yeah. So I had um, uh, direct to consumer, like ready to eat meat snacks. So uh, snack sticks, beef jerky, summer yeah. sausage. And then last year, while we were filming the show, there was a local slaughter plant that would, had just been built by these guys. I mean, it's a five star build out and they only operated it for a year and they went under. And I was able to take advantage of them going under and getting it at a discounted price. Yeah. I wasn't necessarily ready to run a full scale slaughter plant by any means, but the deal was so good buying a brand new facility for 30 cents on the dollar. I couldn't. Yeah, that's awesome. And then the car washes, you got the, the coffee and car wash. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So I, I graduated from college uh, with an MBA and an emphasis on, on accounting and finance. And so I jump into the world of farming and I'm looking at the business model of farming. And just like you said, we have our big three in farming is what we call it. And out of the big three, only one of those, we have any sort of control over whatsoever. Mother nature, we have zero control over. That's right. one of the big three. Number two is global commodity price. What's my grain worth? No control over. So two out of the big three, like just flip a coin. We have no control over them. The only one we can slightly control is our input cost. And even then those vary to the point where you're you don't really control your input costs. I mean, you can try your best. Sure. Um, you can control labor and some of the other things, but it's really, really tough. So farming from a business model perspective, horrible. Your revenue swings from 60% of projected revenue to 120%. And nine times out of 10, it's on the uh, latter side. So it's on the right. lower side of what you project. Uh, you don't collect your money. So you do all this work up front and you don't sell your grain until the following year. So it's a, almost a 365 day cash flow cycle. And I'm getting out of college looking at this and I'm going, how do we make this work? Right. And so I started exploring other industries like, okay, we've got to find a way to supplement the revenue and get more consistent revenue to help make this farm survive. Yeah. And you look at a car wash business, especially like the express car washes, you have recurring revenue through the monthly memberships. You have uh, no, basically your cash flow cycle is non-existent. You don't have to have an accounts receivable department because they have to pay for their service on the upfront side. And if they don't pay for it, they get to go through the exit lane. Right. So yeah, it's got all of these and it's low labor. I mean, it's basically the equipment in the tunnel does 90% of the work. Yeah, Other than yeah. that, you just have a couple of attendants out there making sure that the customer is satisfied. So it's such a better business model. And I was like, okay, if we're going to make this farm survive and, and be able to feed all these mouths we have here at the farm. We've got to supplement it with some solid business models. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I thought it was interesting because I really wasn't expecting the car wash piece to be as heavy a part of the show. Um, but you guys were really like, you know, waist deep in a lot of dealings and stuff, you know, with the car wash. And, um, you know, we'll save that for people to watch, you know, on the show and stuff to learn more about it. But it was, I really did appreciate how in the show and capturing the family and what you guys were doing, you really were moving and showing in a day to day life that, hey, you can be in the field working on tractor, burning fields. And next thing you know, you're shooting across to Kansas City to go meet up with bankers for car wash business or over here on houses that are being built. I guess the hustle factor was it was cool to see that part on display uh, for me. 
if there was anything we could contribute our success to, because we sure as hell are not the smartest in the room. And I wish we were, I wish I was smarter, but we're not. So the only thing that's even contributed to our success thus far is just out hustle. Um, yeah. And I'm hoping to change that to where we can focus a little more and more on the intelligence side and, and, and set ourselves up for success rather than just having to out hustle and work out work everyone. But right. uh, that's all we've been able to do and, and find success in. And, and you're right. We there's no conventional day for us. We aren't uh, focused on any business. Like w there's not a day where I go into the office and I say, OK, I'm solely focusing on the farms today because I'll get calls for the car washes. I, I sure. never know where my day is going to end up. And um, it, it's just a true entrepreneur mindset of, hey, we're opportunists. We're going to try and figure out how to make this work. And um, come hell or high water, we're going to work hard enough to, to figure it out. Yeah, that's that's great. Talk to me a little bit about who had the idea for the, the show, who kind of pressed that to the family, presented it to the family. Cause I know you've done shows before this, you know, another, another show featured on. And so kind of how did that process flow? So, you know, I, I hate to take all the credit for it, but branding and marketing is what I love. Like that is my specialty to a T. So the whole reason I went on a dating show, uh, which was Joe Millionaire, was because I realized how similar we were to Yellowstone. I'm looking at my brother, Jesse. He's a spitting image of Casey Dutton. Obviously, mm -hmm. I, I fly a helicopter. Like, we have this large farm and ranch that we're struggling to keep. And, and my family dynamics are just so interesting. I mean, we're, yeah. we're, we're a mess. I mean, you can see the show and see that. And I was like, hey, if we're going to have to deal with this stress and, and the drama that we deal with, let's at least make it profitable. So. Yeah. I was like, all right, let's get some eyeballs on this. So the whole reason I went on the dating show was to try and introduce uh, the production companies from L.A. to my family in the farm and ranch side. I knew that there was going to be a hometown where they were going to fly to the hometown, see the farm and ranch. We yeah. brought the top six girls from the show up to the farm and ranch. Um, and it was all just getting eyeballs on our farm. Um, yeah. And once we did that, literally since the minute that show ended, we had been getting hit up from production companies about doing this real life Yellowstone. And oh, that, cool. that was the end goal for it. So it all, from there, it just came to what production company do we want to go with? We had six different production companies that were reaching out to me that wanted to shoot a pilot episode to bid it out to the networks. Right. Uh, and I felt really good about Jeff Jenkins productions who did our production. They had done the simple life with Paris Hilton and Nicole Ritchie. They yeah. had done the first 10 seasons of Keeping Up with the Kardashians. They had done all of Bling Empire. Like, they have a track record of these yep. shows. Yeah. So I felt really good about them. I sat down and talked to them. I said, hey, I don't want any manipulation um, for our lives. Like, I don't want you guys to create the story of who we are. I know who we are. And I can tell you right now, we have enough drama going on to fill up multiple seasons of reality TV. So I want to keep it real. Sure, sure. <laughs> And so they, they did that and we feel really good about Jeff Jenkins productions and what they are able to do with the show. That's so cool. And I imagine with it being the second time you kind of been through this process of the reality show, what was the adjustment for the rest of the family? You know, kind of how is that with the camera crews being around? I mean, cause it seems like they're there all damn day, like all, all day, all the time capturing everything all day. So this show was way more comfortable than Joe Millionaire because we were in our environment, our homes, yep. our businesses. And going into shooting, we had several discussions with the production company. And they said the reason why the Kardashians were so successful is because they showed 99% of their life, the good and the bad, to the audience. That's what makes it relatable. If you try to mm -hmm. act like your life is perfect and there's no issues or you parade around with this facade on, the audience can sense that fakeness. And yeah, so yeah. they're like, you just have to lay it all out there, both the good and the bad. Like everyone's flawed. Everyone's got a dysfunctional family. If you showcase that to the audience, they relate way more. And so we said going into it, hey, we are going to show them. We're going to try and one up the Kardashians as far as what we showcase and just let them into everything we've got going on, the good and the bad. And um, man, my, my dad and Cole really uh, followed through on that promise. <laughs> man, Cole had me in tears so many times. That dude had me in tears. Um, and the similarities between him and your dad, it's actually it was really funny to me watching it. Like there's so many similarities between all of you guys and your dad. 
and like the strengths and traits and personality type, you know, characteristics. Um, that was a really cool thing for, for me to see. I love that story. I love how genuinely close you guys are to your dad. I love how genuinely he cares for for you guys and and loves y'all and that's such a neat thing i don't i have a brother um who i don't talk to haven't in, in a long long time for, for various reasons my dad i haven't talked to him in years you know it's it's the total opposite kind of dynamic and you know my thing was like man i i always wanted to create a family where there that was not gonna be the case with my son and i'm fortunate my son has decided like he wants to to work for us and, and build within our business and be a part of the family business, what we're doing. And like that honors me. Like I'm so honored that he wants to do that. And um, when I see the big family dynamic and everyone together, the good, the bad, the shit show, the, the laughs, the, I, it's just very genuine. And I would say if you guys wanted to keep it real and genuine, it very much felt that way. If it wasn't, you did a great job of making it feel that way, but it definitely seemed that that was the case and nobody was kind of putting on. It's like, nope, this is, this is how we, we roll and, you know, for, for good or for bad. And I just thought that was a pretty tremendous thing uh, with the show and the aspects of it. So this was all shot last summer and fall. Is that right? We shot mid-April of last year through late July, uh, and then we had some pickup scenes in August and September to finish out the show. Okay, cool, cool. And then, so how long does the world have to wait until they find out if there's a, a season two? Well, we were 85% greenlit in a little bit of behind-the-scenes stuff. At the very end of the season, it pops up, and it says, to be continued. Mm -hmm. That is the first time in NBC Universal history they've allowed a season one show to say to be continued at the end of the season. That's how much they believe in the show. Wow. So usually they let the ratings come out before they, you know, they see how it does before they say, OK, yeah, season two. The sure. fact that they were willing to do that is a pretty telltale sign that they're they're pretty damn positive there's going to be a season two here. So. We are 85 to 90 percent greenlit, and we've already had discussions about shooting a season two here midsummer, starting it in July. Oh, cool. um, just haven't gotten official confirmation yet. Yeah. Was it kind of nice when the, the cameras dipped out and everything kind of settled down on the farm and it was just focus on a normal back to normal stuff? It is. Yeah, it absolutely is. I mean, those cameras were there, like you said, 24 seven, and it's a job in and of itself. I mean, they were flies on the wall. Don't get me wrong. But whenever you're having to do the one on one interviews that happen between the scenes like that all takes work. And yeah. it's just it's a job like that's what people don't understand is like it, it's so much work. And and that's why at the beginning we were like, all right, let's weigh the risk and reward of what this show could potentially bring. Risk is we tarnish our reputation. Obviously, there's a bunch of drama and it's a shit show. Our bankers are watching this show. Our business associates are watching this yeah, show. Sure. Like there's a lot of risk here, um, you know, but what is the potential reward if we were to run this thing for 10 years, 10 seasons of exposure with all the direct to consumer brands that we have, what could that potentially do to our business and pouring rocket fuel on the growth? Yeah. We're like, well, that's a, a risk reward that we're worth. It's worth chasing after to see what could happen. What's next for the McBees? What's, what's, what are y'all working on? So just running these businesses day to day, um, really the car washes have done so well here in the last four to five months. Like they've completely done a 180 to be completely candid with you. Uh, we opened those things up and, and honestly, we put so much time and investment into the building themselves, the business model, what we had going on. Um, and then with the show, I really didn't have time to market them like I should have. And sure. uh, if, for anyone that's out there running a business, marketing's got to come sales. You can fix a lot of mistakes if you have the sales, but you got to have the sales first. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, it, that's what I put all this time into the build out, like running the perfect car wash, like all of the, the tech side of things. And then we opened up and it was like, what happened? I thought if you build it, they will come. Yeah. No, no. no. you have to go out there and market the hell out of yourself and tell everyone yeah. about yourself. And after the show ended, man, we were in a tough spot there with the car washes. Obviously, um, the private equity deal didn't come through. The show 
you know, dramatizes that a little more than it was in reality. Uh, we didn't want to cut a deal that soon before the car washes were up and stabilized. Sure. Um, but as soon as the show ended, it was like, all right, we got to get boots on the ground and we got to spread the word about what we've got going on with these washes. And, and that's what we did. And it's really paid off here in the last few months. So, uh, right now, you know, farms not on cruise control, but it's basically on cruise control. And I want to work on building up the meat company that we're about to start shipping nationwide. And then these car washes that we're continuing to grow and build out. That's great, man. That, and that's really, really exciting. And you are right. You know, everyone's like, okay, I'm going to focus on this product. Product's going to be so great. Everyone's just going to want it. And we don't have to tell too many people. No one gives a crap about anything that you have or you're selling until you, you make them give a crap about it. And, and that's where like with my businesses, it's, I'm probably always going to be on the revenue generation side of it active because that's the fun part to me. And, and with us, nothing that we do like on my primary business is the dog training. And that's not a recurring revenue model. Like we train your dog. It's trained until you get another dog. There's you don't, no really, recurring you don't have a need for me. I'm not the yeah. $10 an hour guy where you need lessons your entire dog's life. No, yeah. we're going to train that joker and it's going to be awesome. And we're out, moved on to the next one. So every day, you know, there has to be new Sales, clients yeah. found. And what's the best way to reach people who need our service? Is it is it Google pay-per-click? Is it Facebook? Is it, you know, other meta type style platforms? Is it face-to-face? -face? And trying all those things and figuring out what works for your niche in it and then going all in, but also still paying attention to when things start to change and the market shifts a little bit. It's like, all right, we're going to pull resources from here. Now we're dialing in and focusing on this because this is the shift in, in what's happening. So you can still generate that new stuff. Um, I love the recurring revenue model of the car washes. I think that's great. And the same thing with the, the meat plant pickup huge yeah. and you guys do that i mean a lot of that i imagine will can turn into recurring revenue as well you acquire that client and now you're able to use them multiple times yeah i've spent the last eight months and whenever we bought it it was straight up for custom slaughter so basically a local farmer brings in their own beef we slaughter it cut it up for them send it back to them yeah the past eight months have been about logistically figuring out shipping beef nationwide and then getting out of that custom slaughter uh, because it's just not very, it's not a good revenue model and getting it more into the subscription base, like a, it's a butcher box, except we own every single facet. So it's our beef, our pork right. our bison that we're sending out to you. The, the animal, like when we say farm to table, the animal never leaves our farm until it's in a package to come to you. Correct. That's, that's the difference between us and like a butcher box or an Omaha steaks. They're using all these different slaughter plants across the country. Everything is right there on our farm. So when you want to talk about farm to table, I can show you the pasture that your freaking steak grew up in and where it was born. Yeah, that's awesome. Because that was the question I was going to ask you is with that is all the meat being sourced from the farm itself. And that's a huge leg up for you guys. It is. That's the big marketing ploy because everyone's like, why are you doing what Butcher Box is doing? And I'm like, yes, it's the same model, but as we get into more of this transparent customer uh, knowledge center and, and knowledge market, they want to know down to a field level where their meat's coming from, how it was raised. Was it humanely and ethically raised? What was it? Right. Thing? I can, like I said, I could show you the pasture where your steak comes from because we own every single facet of the supply chain. Yeah, that's incredible. That's, that's really, really incredible. It's neat. Well, and and now the, the apex piece, the apex um, like the beef sticks and all that, that was kind of your first venture into the, the shipping of the protein. Yeah. I wanted to do it in phases. I didn't want to take it all on at once and try and do raw beef shipping. And like, that was just, it, you can only eat an elephant one bite at a time. So I was like, phase <laughs> one, I'll make meat sticks and beef jerky and try shipping that phase two, um, which obviously happened a little sooner than I expected. I thought that was going to be three to five year plan was to build out a slaughter plant and start slaughtering. Um, and then that one fell in my lap and I was like, okay, I'm not ready for it, but damn it, it's a good deal. And I'm not going to pass it up. So ended up buying that. And and now the past eight months, I've been like, all right, we've got to get the, the fulfillment center set up. We're building out a fulfillment center to be able to ship all this out, getting the, the shipping uh, metric set up for how we're going to ship it, where we're going to ship it to. Um, it, it's been a, been a lot to take place, but we're, it's going to be launching next week. So it's all coming to fruition here. Oh, wow. So it's time. 
It's time. Yeah, I was All trying right. to time it out with this show. The show was originally supposed to air um, March 25th. And so I had all this geared up. I was like, all right, March 25th is our drop dead date. And then in February, the network called us. It's like, hey, moving it up to March 11th. And I was like, oh, shit. Like I had the fulfillment center that was going to be done. I had um, our apparel side, like our merch side. Yeah. I had the meat co. It was all set for March 25th. And then I'm scrambling to try and get it done faster. Um, and, and, you know, we didn't hit the exact March 11th date that the show dropped on, but we're going to be pretty close. Sure. Yeah, that's cool. We'll have to. Logan, we're going to have to jump on there and put some orders in, oh, get some stuff sent out. Appreciate it. Well, That's there was cool. one point there that I think um, I, I do want to just point out if anyone's listening. And I know with how big you guys are on on personal development and continually investing in yourself, you know Alex Hermosi or, or at least. Oh, yeah, yeah. That is one point. I, I love Alex Hermosi. Love everything he has to say. The one thing I will disagree with him on day in and day out is he says, Spend two years building your product, making the perfect product, and let it market for you. I completely disagree with that because you're going to be wrong with the product or model that you come up with. You so you spend two years building it and then you launch it and it's you you lost two years worth of time and it's the wrong model. People like this little niche of that product, not the product itself. Yeah. I would yeah. rather go to market and figure it out by what the customers are telling me. Yeah. You're a hundred percent right, man. I, that's one of the things we were talking about the podcast before we, we started the show and, you know, we're coming up on a hundred episodes and I look at this, I said, man, I should be at 300 episodes, but I took so long to start it because it wasn't exactly how I thought it should be. So rather than, and then we were talking about that exponential effect of once you hit a certain mark and how, you know, the algorithm starts supporting you and putting you in front of more people. I'd be so much further ahead had I just started putting content out rather than what I thought was perfect content, just content. And, but you know, it's hard, it's hard to wrap your head around that. And when people have these ideas or concepts and you truly do see it as your baby, mm -hmm. well, I'm not trying to put an ugly baby out, right? <laughs> you know, I, I don't want people telling me my baby's ugly, but the reality is people are going to tell you if your baby's ugly, whether you want to hear it or not. And you might think it's perfect, but there's going to be parts of it that pick up and get ran with. And that's when you adjust, right? Because there's no original idea. Correct. There's, there's our original take on an idea. There's what makes you, Stephen McBee, unique and special in your situation with the farm to say, hey, we could take that general idea and we could really put a big process improvement, quality improvement of the product itself, you know, a better process and experience for the customer and go that route. And that's not something someone else can do because they don't have certain things in alignment. And if they did, they might be able to see it from the angle that you see it from. But only you can see it from your angle because that's your situation. Exactly. And that's why I try to tell people all the time. It's like, you know, you have your vision for what you want to accomplish and where you want to be. You create goals that are kind of your benchmarks if you're tracking towards that vision or not. But guys, visions change, you know, and if, if, if I had the vision I had five, 10 years ago for today is very different. <laughs> I'm sitting in a very small segment of that vision I had and what businesses allowed us to create and family and, and different things have played into it. Have matured priorities have changed a little bit and the vision i have now i'm not behind on it's just that's that next phase and what we've built in the last five to ten years still support it yep. but the goals have to serve your purpose your goals have to serve your vision if they don't serve your vision they don't serve your purpose there's no sense in pursuing them correct you know because if, if your goals do serve you and and the vision it's easy to make those adjustments when you're like, hey, I was 80% right on that. Now let's get better and let's get 100% right by making this adjustment. And now what are these new goals? And so I think it's a really great point that you bring up. It's like, get it out there yes. and let the market tell you. Yes. Yeah. Imagine if you spent two years working on your business model before listening to any customer feedback and you think you create this perfect business model and you go out there and it flops. You could have had it a perfect business model by launching in in month two and then spending the next what twenty two months revising it. Man, that is so right. 
And it's so right, but but well, and that's again, you know, what we're talking about number of podcasts that get past like eight episodes or three episodes. How many businesses make it past that first year mark? How many businesses make it past the the first two? And it's it's hard. And what I've told people is like, look, okay, your business failed. The business failed. That doesn't mean you failed. What did you learn? What did you extract from that situation? And now what is it that you want to do? And how are you going to apply those things? To the next thing, like what happened to you, you're not unique in it not working out. Yeah, that's, that's the majority. It's like <laughs> yeah, it's nine times out of 10, it's not going to work out. Right. You know, you, you want to go in this entrepreneurial path. I mean, you better have some grit and thick skin because that is most likely what's going to happen. And if because it didn't work, that hemmed you up, man, you got to see past that, extract and move forward and get it going and, and get it done. Um Look, my favorite personality in the entire show. All right, you ready for this? My, my favorite personality out of the entire season of the show is your dog, Sitka. Oh. That, like, w- one, just a great-looking shepherd. Great-looking dog. <laughs> and, um, like, oh, there they go. There. Hey, <laughs> yeah. Hi, buddy. <laughs> Hi, bud. Yeah, great looking dog. And this, yeah. the the producers did such a great job of building the dog's personality into the episodes. Like some chaos would be going on, and they just pan over to the dog just sitting there looking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was dying. No, I was- no, it was funny. We were we were laughing watching the dogs, and then there's the one scene where Sika brings in a dead deer head into the house. And oh god, I was in tears. <laughs> I was in tears, man, because that just makes so much sense. And that's such a funny, normal thing. Um, so what, um, so with the, the the family itself, I know that I don't want to ruin stuff. I want people to watch it, but there was some cool stuff happened with Jesse and his girlfriend towards the end of the, the season, which is cool. That's exciting. Um, you know, it seems like, you know, they did a nice job of kind of giving backstory and setting up relationship stuff and things of that nature um good and bad yeah <laughs> depending, depending on on who they're chasing what did you and the family feel like you wish would have been caught more or maybe um shared more um if anything or did you feel like it was damn near spot on to how you guys would have wanted to be portrayed first and foremost the production company and the network did an incredible job i yeah, I cannot imagine how much footage they took compared to compressing that down into 10 one hour episodes. Like it, they did an incredible job. Um, the only thing that we wish uh, would have been conveyed more is you go back to your uh, talking about how close my family is and, and just how much my dad loves us and how much he puts on the line for us. You know, he's made out to be um, his personal life is showcased and put in a spotlight for reality tv show reasons it's drama filled and it's a mess and, and everyone can see that but that to me i'm glad you're able to see the genuine love he has for us because for us watching it back we're like man you only see the bad sides of my dad you don't get to see the good sides like sure that dude works seven days a week like 12 hours a day the other four are spent you know partying or drama but he works 12 <laughs> hours a day and he's done that for 30 years busting his ass to run yeah. these businesses like he is the hardest worker i've ever met and if you're his friend he will take care of you like to the end yeah. i wouldn't ever want to be his girlfriend um but <laughs> if you're his friend he is the best friend you will ever have in your life right yeah and, and yeah. he's the best dad i mean he's such a good dad to us you know we take his relationship advice with a grain of salt but everything else man he wants the best for us and he loves us boys like no other in that was the only thing I'm like, man, they, that isn't really seen. And, you know, I'm catching a lot of hate on social media saying, don't listen to your dad at all. And, you know, your dad's a, a horrible person and whatever. Sure. Maybe I'm like, yeah, he's got his flaws in relationships. He's very jaded in relationships. I'll be the first right. to admit that. But man, in every other facet, that dude is a rock star and works his ass off. And he loves yeah. us boys like no other. Yeah. And I do, I, I do feel like that came across very clearly. Like if, I, I mean, I feel like if you're a, I mean, I don't know if I'm the the typical consumer of the show or not, um, you know. But for me, it was it was easy to see. And like your dad, you know, shoot, I'm probably how how old are you, Stephen? I'm 29. 29, yeah. So I'm closer to your dad's age, 
than than you, right? So I'm in kind of this fun zone where I'm like, my kids are grown. Well, my daughter will graduate next year. Logan graduated a year ago. And my wife and I, just be her and I, we're probably going to move from Virginia to Dallas. And I'm ready to go. Like, hey, I feel energized. I'm ready with the businesses. I got a new energy about myself. And I like to go out and like when I'm in Dallas and do things. It was so funny. Your dad made a comment when he was in when he's in Nashville, he can just cut loose and like do whatever and kind of do my thing. When I'm at home, it's work, it's work, it's work. But when I get here, it's kind of like, hey, I'm not necessarily known by everybody, and I can just kind of be this alternate personality. That's yeah. exactly how I felt for the longest time when I would go out to Dallas. Mm -hmm. And people are like, man, you, there's like this different side of you that we don't ever see back home. And I'm like, well, back home is boring. Like, right. this is new. And no one really knows me out here now for like four and a half years. I'm out there a couple times a month. We got a condo out there now and stuff. And so now I am starting to, to meet more people and stuff. So I got to dial it back a little dial bit. Dial it back a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> just, a little more. <laughs> just, just a little bit. But, yeah. um, you know, I could totally see that piece. And like, you know, with your dad, the part, I mean, he's a young dude, he's 50, 55 years old, somewhere around there, I think they had said, right? He just turned 52. Yeah. I mean, he's young. Yeah. He's young. And he's working his ass off. He's going to blow off some steam, blow off some steam. And the thing is, to, to your point, right or wrong, it's his choice to, I mean, it's his choice to make, right? And to, to do his thing. But I don't think, I think anybody who missed the fact with the care, investment, genuine love that, Steve has for the family and sending shit on social. I mean, they're going to find something shit to send about right. anyway. Right. Those right. people, they just, they'll never see it. Cause they, they don't want to see things like that. They don't exactly. open their mind to see things like that. Cause I think that's a pretty tough piece to miss when like 70% of the time when he was talking, it's about you guys, the boys. Correct. You know, and the other 30% is the farm. Yes. So yeah, that's exactly right. Well, and, and you know, that get some comments that are like, oh, he just drinks nonstop. He's an alcoholic. That dude, I there was not in a single cup or bottle of alcohol in our house from the time I was born until every single one of us boys were at least 20 years old. There was no alcohol anywhere. Like straight, like he worked, he coached us boys in every single sport we played. And that was his life. There was no drinking, like no yeah. alcohol until we were 20 years old. So like, th it's not like he grew up like partying like this when we were, when he was actually in like the decisive years of, of shaping who we are as people, he was a strict dad that focused on work and sports. And that yeah. was it. So it was like all this partying and stuff. That's him cutting loose because he spent 28, 30 years, like just streamlined on business and making sure the boys were being raised the right way. Yeah, no, it, it, good on y'all. I mean, I, I always have a lot of respect when a family opens up like this mm -hmm. because the thing that you feel like in general society worries about most is what will people think? Yes. What will people say? Right. They got to put all their perfect shit on Instagram and Facebook and TikTok. Everything's got to be, Oh, you take a picture of your friends. You got to redo it five times. Like my COO, if we take a selfie together, I just hand her the phone. I'm like, let me know. We got to do it again. Right. You know, I can't yeah. just take it and it'd be done. She's going to want to fix her hair, or stand to the left of me instead or whatever. My wife's kind of the same way with it. Yeah. And it's cool. Like, okay. But everyone's so worried about it. And then when I see like a family, it's the same thing with the Kardashians. I'm like, shit, like they just open it all up mm -hmm. and it's like to hell with it. It, it's, it, it's pretty impressive to me. Well, that's how us boys, all of us boys on the show, to be completely candid, like when I say, if you aren't paying my bills or you're not making my life better in some way, I don't give a shit about your opinion. Like I don't, <laughs> and I hate to be crude like that, but it's the truth. And yeah. even my mom is watching this show and she's texting us boys like, you boys, what is everyone going to think? Like, what is the, the people we grew up with going to think of you boys? Or I can't believe you cussed on TV. And uh, a lot of the girls from the show, a lot of our girlfriends say the same thing. Like, I can't believe you made yourself out to be an idiot like that. And <laughs> us boys are like, look, 
we'd rather not put on this facade again it goes back to what i was saying earlier every family is dysfunctional as hell yes everyone every single person is flawed like i'd rather be real about who we are knowing that you know we've got some some warts on us or some bad sides to us everyone does then try to like parade around like we're some perfect human living this perfect life that's not real for anyone no no the the, the unreality of reality tv yes exactly and, and there's like, probably plenty of that too there is and i think that's why this show even though yeah we're catching some hate and you know catching some bad comments it's hitting so hard because we just literally laid it all out there and said hey here's who we are look up our skirt we don't care right no nah, that's cool that's that's good on you so right now folks it on the farm getting things efficient getting numbers right focusing on these car washes you're about to launch the the meat plant you know and then that shipping and stuff so so you got it all i mean it, you got hands in a little bit of all of it i do yeah trying to run it all it I wouldn't recommend that to, to anyone. Um, if I could go back in time, I would focus on one really good business model and just ride that out until I can hire CEOs to run each of the different ones. I'm, I'm running pretty ragged right now, to be honest, but yeah. um, I got myself into a hole of like, Hey, I've already got all these companies. I got to figure out how to make them run now. <laughs> yep. No, I mean, we did something very similar and I will tell you like for your own sake, um, the sooner you can get those solid leaders, right? Because the math won't math in the beginning. No matter how you cut it, you're like, well, I can't afford to put a position in that role. I can't. You, you can't. You truly can't. But you can't afford not to either as soon as you find that right person. Because it's going to be that individual who's 100% of their energy and focus and expertise is focused on the car washes, for instance, right? Whereas it's getting 25% of you at best when you can allow for it to have a good 25 percent of you and the same thing with the meat side the farm itself in general and just having been in that position before where i was the guy for all of them we did fine we did well but i compare it to how we did when i got the right person in place who i'm just feeding into those five six seven eight leaders yeah. rather than having to feed into everybody for everything and i let them take over and, and take that control piece, man, it, it, it lights out when we made that adjustment. Um, but it's a part of the process and finding those people isn't easy. It's that's, that is like my one fatal character flaw is I want control because I'm so, I'm so leery of extending trust because when it backfires, yep. you feel like an idiot, but I will yep. tell you the, the car wash in the farms, we found those people. Oh, so the good. car wash, the car wash, I extended that trust to our, uh, a position that was basically running the company. And right at the end of the show, I come back after we got done filming. Cause I wasn't involved. It was so hard to be involved in, in the car wash when we were filming, come yeah. back. Car wash is an absolute shit show. Like we're like, it's in dire straits to be completely honest. So fire that position because that was the guy that I had extended trust to. Yep. horrible he had a wreck of a personal life it was extending over into the business we promoted from within to a guy that had just been a gm but was a i mean he's younger than i am he's 27 years old nice. um like no one you would ever think would be like a true uh executive style leader but we he was just even keeled emotionally like nothing phased him and, and he knew what he was doing and he knew how to lead people since that day of firing that previous guy we have hit a sales record every single week since. And it, yeah. I have not gotten, I used to get six calls a day that were like personal crisis. Like, hey, so-and-so is about to fist fight so-and-so. Like stupid crap. That was yep. what I was dealing with while I was trying to run everything. I haven't heard of any major crises since that day. Yeah. It's wild. Like, like you said, the math doesn't math. And it's so hard for me to say, we can afford this guy right now because we can't. We're a startup. Like there's, how am I going to afford this guy? And it's like all of a sudden that you find the right person and it just is like the, the lights start, start shining down from heaven. And you're like, this is how people make it in business. Like, this is wild. <laughs> yeah. I don't have to do it all. I don't got to I don't got to know all of it. And man, at least for my personality, every, morale got better when I stopped dealing with everybody. Culture is so much better. Oh Culture God. So better. Like I, it's I'm an emotional roller coaster because when we're running around trying to run all these companies, we're dealing with multiple crises every day. There's yeah. like, 
no way we can be at our best if we're trying to juggle all these different high priority deals. Yep. And yeah. so That's when I got hard. when I pulled myself out of the car wash, the car wash culture improved drastically. Sales records were hit each week. The farm is the same way. Now I just got to figure out the the meat facility um, is really the big one that I'm working on next. That's that's the number one. I got to figure out a way to pull myself out of that. Good for you, man. Good for you. Yeah. Well, look, I want to honor your time, man. I, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show and you know talking about you know the the adventures with with Peacock and the family and just what you guys got going on. And it's a lot of fun to see and um, it's a lot of fun to hear you know, about, you know, plans for the future for y'all and, and what you're working on. And, you know, I wish you guys the very, very best, you know, truly we do. I, I pray the weather is right, you know, and the prices are right and, and everything flows great. Um, and, you know, I know a lot of people feedback I've seen from, you know, about the show and not people I've talked to personally about the show. A lot of people out there really, really are enjoying it and you know having a great time with it so um i just wanted to thank you for for coming on and if there's ever anything i can do for you you know how to get a hold of me um you ever need to vent or anything just give me a holler man and and happy to to be an ear for you well thank you so much for having me on it's always i, I enjoy the podcast where i'm talking with people about business or i'm talking with people that i had relationships before the show ever came about and it's not just about why would so and so say this or this? You know, talking show drama. I, yeah, I don't like yeah. those podcasts, and and I have to do a bunch of them, unfortunately. Oh, I'm so sure. I sincerely, sincerely enjoy these these talks and these podcasts where we get to uh, talk about the the more important matters. Absolutely. Well, Stephen, take it easy, man. I know you got a lot to get to, uh, guys. If you uh, enjoyed this show, or you got any questions for Stephen, well, let me ask this, Stephen. How can people follow you all? Learn more about the show. Yeah. My Instagram and our farm's Instagram page are the best sources to go to. From there, you can branch out and find out about all of our companies. Um, awesome. My Instagram is at Stephen McBee, um, Stephen with a V, and then at McBee Farms is the two Instagram pages to follow. And then from there, we're reposting content from the washes, the meat company. You'll be able to cool. find everything we've got going on. Awesome. We'll make sure to plug that. Thanks, everybody. We appreciate you listening, and we'll catch you next time on the Big Dog Podcast. 